I'm not going to tell you anything complicated or difficult. Uh, I'm here to entertain you because I have no useful skills. I'm an author, uh, so that's what I do. But hopefully you will find something, what I say, that will be of interest. Um, so what I want to talk about is the importance of stories, uh, so a different kind of speculation than the kind of speculation that most of you are familiar with. I'm not so, so much interested in the price of Bitcoin, even though I am deeply interested in the future of crypto uh, and blockchain. Um, what I want to talk about is how do we think about the future, why do we tell stories about the future, and is it actually any good in terms of predicting the future? All right, so let's get started. Um, what I want to do is to offer a little bit of uh, retrospective, right? So, what I'm going to show you are pictures of how 100 years ago artists envisioned life in the year 2000. Uh, 2000. Um, this is a pretty famous series of cartoons made by French artists uh, between the years of 1899 and 1910. Uh, they envisioned life in the year 2000, uh, and uh, they are very interesting for us to look at today. So first, there's, there's a vision of how life in the home will change. Um, you see a, a maid um, operating a, what looks to be a self-moving uh, self vacuum cleaner floor sweeper combined into one. Uh, what is interesting to me is that the person still has to be there to attend the machine. The machine saves labor, but apparently nothing else. This is, this is how they envision life in the year 2000. Not quite what we have. Um, here's another one about battle cars. Uh, even as a matter of speculative fiction, this is quite interesting to me. There doesn't seem to be enough armor uh, for, for this to be effective. And notice, this is just you know, a decade or so before World War I, so um, not, not quite the most on target speculation. Um, Here's one uh, that's more sad than funny uh, in view of what happened in Paris. Uh, we still don't really have the technology to rescue people from burning buildings in this day and age, uh, even though even 100 years ago people saw the need for it. Um, not clear why. Uh, this surely is the sort of thing we can solve if we want to, but we have not been able to. Uh, yet another one. Uh, this is about... Uh, again, and it's called an aerial battle uh, in the year 2000. Of course, we all know that is not where aerial battles have gone. Uh, but at the time, you know, everyone thought zeppelins would be quite important in the future. They, they are, uh, they, they still are actually, or, or they will be, so never say never. But this is certainly not the future that we're living in. All right. So a lot of you will probably say, okay, that's kind of unfair. You know, 100 years ago, French artists, that's not the most serious kind of future speculation. What about, you know, people who really think deeply about the future and who have actually put a lot of time into it? Um, well, uh, it turns out that we have some examples from that area as well. Um, between the years 1958 and 1963, we sort of had the golden age of, of American futurism. Um, 1958 is when NASA was founded, and 1963 is when the Jetsons went off the air. So in between that period is when we had some of the most optimistic, utopian, serious visions of the future. Uh, and there's a series published um, in the Sunday comic pages uh, called Closer Than We Think, that tries to present futurism and speculations about the future in a really serious way. Um, so that up there uh, is the vision of education in the future, what they call push-button education. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff about this. One is obviously the kind of interface they envisioned for how um, Internet, I guess, internet education would work. Uh, the teacher is being beamed in onto a screen and the students sit in the same classroom working from their consoles. It's not clear to me why students need to gather together for this type of instruction at all. 
uh, there's no physical teacher there, so why can't this be done distributedly or at home? Um, it's also not clear to me uh, what benefit uh, is, is being derived from this style of instruction that doesn't appear terribly individualized to me. Um, but most amusingly to me is, is the use of, of, of <laughs> the blonde highlight. Uh, it appears that she is the teacher's favorite student and, and the center of attention. Uh, kind of an interesting aesthetic. Um, here's another one. This is about the future of cars, uh, which is a theme we will return to um, pretty soon. Um, I find this one fascinating because it talks about how the car of the future is going to run on sun rays. Uh, we sort of arguably have that, uh, not quite quite in that way, uh, but that was how they envisioned it. They envisioned cars being powered by, literally, by the rays of the sun directly. Um, it's an interesting vision, uh, did not quite come to fruition. Okay, so that's all, you know, from the past. So now the question is, what about people in more recent decades? Other speculative artists, you know, uh, in more recent years, informed by modern culture and technology, have they done a better job? Uh, well, so we can take a look at some popular pieces of sci-fi entertainment and see how well they've done, okay? So we've got um, certain vision of the future, uh, not quite what we have. Uh, let's, let's see some other famous visions of the future. Uh, this seems to be a parallel reality that's more true in fiction, again, than in reality. We haven't even retouched the surface of the moon yet, let alone trying to go to Jupiter. Um, we don't really have empathy testing to distinguish between androids and humans. Uh, not clear that would be the right test anyway. And finally, we don't have a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles in which androids roam around soulfully looking for origami unicorns. Although, if you go to a lot of these conferences and conventions, you might say that is not true at all. In fact, you may go to certain cities in our great country on the West Coast or the East Coast and go to certain conventions where after a day of buzzwords, you do feel like you're not quite fully human. And uh, what are people looking for? Unicorns. So that bit of prediction actually is kind of true. All right, so um, all that aside, let's, let's think about this seriously. Why is predicting the future difficult? And why do science fiction authors and futurists never get it right? Is it because they don't know enough? Is it because they just haven't thought hard enough about the future? Um, well, future prediction is an incredibly, incredibly difficult art. Um, and I will tell you uh, a, a one specific example of future prediction and, and, and sort of tease through why it's so difficult. So everybody is talking about electric cars these days, or at least the media seems to think that's the most awesome thing. Um, well, electric cars are nothing new. <laughs> they, were, they were very popular uh, at the turn of the century. Not this past one, but the one before that. Um, in fact, back at the turn of the century in New York City, 38% um, of the cars on the road run on electricity. Um, Thomas Edison thought that was the, uh, the future um, and, and heavily bet on it. Um, another 40% of the cars run on something um, even more obscure, um, steam. Um, steam punk was a real thing. Um, those steam power cars were the majority of the cars on the streets. And then the very last part of the market, 22% were powered by gasoline, internal combustion engine. If you were a developer or a investor back at that time, you, and you were faced with picking the future, it is not clear at all that gasoline would be the future. If you were embedded in that moment, Steam was the proven technology. It, was, it, it is literally the technology that powered the Industrial Revolution. There is no reason to believe Steam would not continue to dominate the future. 
Or you could bet on electricity. Thomas Edison, the Tesla of his day, bet on electricity, and it is in fact a far superior technology compared to competing engines for cars. It is quiet, it is not polluting, um, it is easy to operate, it did not need a hand crank to start. Uh, it was uh, compared to steam engines, which required a long time to heat up. Uh, electri electrical cars start right away, and they did not make the kind of horrible noise that gasoline engines did. Um, so if you were trying to bet on the future, electric cars would have been the future for sure. And if you were writing science fiction back then, you would imagine a future 1976 powered entirely by electric cars everywhere, okay? Um, in fact, there were cultural arguments for electric cars too. Certainly it is true that electric cars didn't have the best range at the time, but neither did gasoline powered cars. In fact, the roads were so bad that gasoline cars failed all the time. There were so many competing standards for operating gasoline cars, they were complicated to operate. Um, in fact, many newer drivers in cities could not learn to operate a gasoline powered car because it is far more complicated to operate one of those and to shift gears compared to an electric car, which didn't have that kind of problem. Um, so if you were making bets, electric car would have been the future for sure. But then something happened, <laughs> which no one predicted at the time, um, and that was the discovery of oil in Texas. Almost overnight, cheap gasoline became a reality. And in terms of operating cost, there was simply no competition against the gasoline-powered car. And as a result of that, all sorts of problems just got solved on the way. Um, the electric starter was invented, so you no longer had to hand crank to start it. Um, manufacturers got together and standardized on controls. So the user interface we're all familiar with today got settled on at that time. So steam fell out of favor because it just, you could not get a steam engine to start up immediately the way you need it to. Um, and electric cars became way too expensive and it fell by the wayside and we ended up with a gasoline powered automobile industry. But there was no reason at the time in that moment you could have foreseen this. Now, in retrospective, if you go read histories of the automobile industry, they all make it sound like the triumph of the gasoline engine was inevitable, okay? This is the problem with the human species. We, as a species, have a tendency to tell stories about things that are not stories, okay? We have a tendency to understand everything in terms of causes and effects and plots and arcs and conspiracies and all sorts of narrative tricks. We literally cannot understand the world except through that way. This is why it's so hard to explain certain things that are scientific truth to people. Um, you know, I, I challenge you to try to explain the theory of evolution without resorting to some sort of teleological narrative technique, which is um, what almost everyone ends up doing, even though evolution is completely random and has nothing to do with any kind of plot. Uh, people just tend to push some kind of cause into these explanations. And it's inevitable when we look at history, um, the practice of history um, is such, well, uh, I actually worked for many years as a, as a litigation consultant in which I had to research the history of technology and patents in depth. So I'm very familiar with this tendency to tell stories, to retroactively construct plausible narratives. Um, we have a tendency when dealing with history to tell stories about how things came to be and we sort of make it sound inevitable. But the reality is at any moment when there's a challenge, there's going to be teams around the world, tens, dozens, hundreds of teams competing to solve the problem, all taking very different approaches. And the one that ultimately triumphs, it almost inevitably triumphs over some sort of fortuitous event, the discovery of oil in Texas, some sort of fashion shift. 
something that you cannot possibly predict happens to lead things down a certain way, and one solution emerges as the victor. But then we have a tendency to go back and reconstruct history and say that triumph was inevitable. There were reasons for it. The technology was somehow better. It, you could see somehow that it, its triumph was inevitable. And my point is, this is the result of survivorship bias. This is the result of the narrative fallacy. We have a tendency to reconstruct narratives of inevitability and then use that kind of story to guide our speculation into the future. It is completely useless and nonsense. That will never work, okay? So, having said all that, uh, all right. So today we're faced with the same kind of speculative future. What is the future of transportation, right? So we've got flying cars, we've got the Uberization of all transportation, we've got self-driving cars, we've got Tesla, of course, we've got hydrogen power cells, we've got some more outrageous solutions like these tunnels, which I think are pretty awesome. Uh, we also, of course, have the bikes eat cars uh, school of thinking. Um, you can take a look at all of these and apply lessons from history and try to derive some kind of conclusion and say that one is inevitably going to triumph. And uh, I'm going to bet you that uh, you're, you're going to be wrong because history is no guide to the future uh, because life is just one damn thing happening after another. There are no character arcs in life and no plots. Um, you, you cannot tell the future based on the past and any kind of extrapolation is ultimately useless. All right, so having said all that, um, what does this have to do with crypto and all this stuff? Okay, today, when you go to com conferences like this, or if you're just talking to people who are excitedly pitching you ideas, what you're hearing is a lot of competing stories, okay? That's all pitches are. Pitches are stories, okay? Um, you, can, you, can, you can dress it up with all kinds of data and figures and whatever you want, but all you have are basically competing stories, all right? So there's lots of stories about what the future of crypto is going to be. Um, and they center around a lot of, lot of topics that, that are very much in the air, full of buzzwords. So there are thoughts about the paradox of the popularity of cryptocurrency. Um, you know, if crypto actually became popular enough to pose a threat to fiat currency, perhaps the consequence of that is going to be a much heavier regulatory hand. Um, despite all the dreams of, of, of Bitcoin sovereignty, uh, we will, Jimmy is going to have fun with this. Uh, despite all the talk about Bitcoin sovereignty, you can't solve the fact that we have meat bodies living in actual jurisdictions and the government is always gonna come down <laughs> and do something to you. So there's no way to avoid the fact that you cannot escape into the blockchain. Um, so regulation is inevitable. By the time cryptocurrency becomes popular enough to pose a threat, perhaps the government will respond not on the blockchain, but off chain, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, there are other stories centered around executability. Uh, so stories about smart contracts. You know, there are utopian visions of how entire new types of organizations, institutions can be constructed around smart contracts so that code is literally law and we no longer have to rely on the judicial system and all the rest of the untrustworthy jurisdictions around the globe. Um, that's a lovely vision, but these are just stories, and, and I can easily tell a counter story that will make that story seem completely unbelievable. Um, there are speculation about the benefits of the incorruptibility of, of blockchain visions of, of, of history. Um, perhaps this will allow us to finally eliminate government corruption um, and rent-seeking in administration. Imagine if the federal budget were put onto the blockchain so that we can see transparently what the government is actually doing with our money. Would that kind of radical transparency really lead to democracy as we envisioned it? Or would it lead to new kinds of problems? 
So you can tell all kinds of fun stories about crypto, and science fiction authors like me love it because you don't actually have to make any of these ideas work in reality. All you have to do is make up a story and tell it, and people will pay you money. I'd rather you pay me in Bitcoin, but money is good. Um, so you can make up all kinds of stories you want as a science fiction author, and you don't need to back it up with any kind of real implementation. So Storytelling for me is perfectly fine, but I really have to caution the rest of you against believing your stories as though they are the truth. Our stories about the past are not the truth. They are just stories organizing the facts that have survived into a coherent narrative so we can understand it. It will be a total mistake to, mistake, to, to think that narrative is the same thing as the truth, and that somehow understanding that narrative means that you will be able to tell the story of the future. All right, so having said all that, what is, what is the point of, of science fiction or storytelling at all? It, am I saying that there's no value to storytelling whatsoever? Well, of course not. I'm not gonna speak against my livelihood. There actually is a real good reason for telling stories about the future, all right? So science fiction is not about predicting the future, okay? This is how folks who understand the technical details of modern computing thought about cyberpunk, okay? Pretty harsh, but here's the thing. Just because you understand the technical details of the, of the technology does not mean you also understand every conceivable application of that technology. If you were working on the internet back in the early 1990s, you could not have possibly envisioned that Instagram would become such an important part of how many people make their livelihoods. You could not have envisioned it. Um, sometimes your knowledge of the technical details of a subject blinds you to more outrageous possibilities and applications of that technology. So it actually is important for you to let yourself go and speculate about the future, and in fact, to let people who do not seem to know what they're talking about come in and speculate on the future. They may not understand how the blockchain actually works at a technical level, but they may be able to see possibilities that you cannot see. And rather than getting stuck at a local maximum you probably do want some disruptive outsider's perspective once in a while to get you out and see if you can optimize in a better way. And then finally, um, I just want to say here is the part of science fiction that I actually do think is helpful. Science fiction is no good at predicting the future, but stories about surviving cataclysmic change are useful and important for us. The pace of change is accelerating, and technology is not going to stop evolving. All of us are going to go through multiple disruptions of, of the way we make our living, right? I'm, I'm a lawyer and also a software engineer, and if you know anything about these professions, you know that disruption is literally the coin of the realm. That's, that's how it is. What you learned, or thought you knew five years ago will be of no use whatsoever five years later. Change and disruption is a constant, and we all have to get used to it. Science fiction is great because it's filled with stories of how people survive cataclysmic change, and it teaches you a way of thinking, a way of preparing yourself for change. It doesn't tell you the exact change that's going to come, but it does prepare you for living with constant apocalypse as a, as a way of life. Um, it, I guess that, that will be the takeaway I, I want to leave you with. Science fiction teaches you how to live with constant apocalypse, and that's not a bad thing. Thank you very much.